Hello everyone, it's Jason Godfrey here with the 101 Thoughts Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about college course placement with Andrew Mose. It's a tough topic. Just as choosing which college you go to is a life-changing decision, choosing which classes you take once you're in college is another life-changing decision. And it's a decision that students often don't have the freedom to make, as colleges often place students into their classes for the first few semesters. Today, we'll explore the interesting ways research has looked at placement, particularly writing placement, and what it means for you and me. Without further ado, welcome to the 101 Thoughts Podcast. Andrew Moose is a PhD student in the Joint Program in English and Education. He also works as a graduate student mentor in the English Department Writing Program. His current research interests include responding to student writing and equitable writing assessment practices in the composition classroom, as well as how hierarchies are constructed in collaborative writing communities. He earned a BSE in English and Modern Languages from Emporia State University and an MA in Rhetoric and Composition from the University of Kansas. He's presented at every major writing and rhetoric conference you've ever heard of, including Conference on College Composition and Communication, Language and Rhetoric Conference, Computers and Computers and Writing. He's also published in several journals, including a co-authored piece, Directed Self-Placement as a Tool to Foreground Student Agency. He's an expert teacher, and he's going to spend the next little bit telling us all about student placement in American post-secondary education. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, and that was a a great introduction. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, Tried to do you justice. I'm sure I left a lot on the table. As you say, you made me sound actually much, much better and more uh, expert than I think I actually am, but uh, thank you. Let me, let me ask you some questions about college placement. Who does college placement impact? Yeah, I mean, so if we're talking, uh, well, placement generally or writing placement even more specifically, I mean, pretty much uh, almost every student, as your students uh, listening will know, go through writing placement processes, get sorted into classrooms using various Uh, tests and measures that are sometimes made transparent to them, sometimes aren't. Um, So I'd say pretty much uh, if we're talking, you know, college, uh, pretty much every single college student goes through um, or has to test out of some sort of placement program. Um, So I'd say it's applicable to anybody who's interested in college, uh, in college right now, or who has gone through college. Yeah, yeah. So what is at stake with college placement? Yeah, so, I mean, personally, speaking towards kind of my research interests, why I think (laughs) uh, writing placement and college placement is so important is because when you don't critically ask questions about how students are placed into certain categories, uh, when you don't critically investigate kind of the things you're valuing, uh, particularly around language, you you can find ways that um, students are kind of sorted into categories that... um, you know, correlate with race and other sorts of uh, other sorts of things that uh, produce uh, unjust outcomes for certain racialized populations, gendered populations, um, uh, you know, disabled populations, all sorts of <laughs> ways that language gets used as a proxy to measure other sorts of things. And if we're not very, very critically thinking about the way language is linked to all these other identities, you create Uh, outcomes for students that are inherently unjust. Right. Yeah, I like that. There's a lot to go in with that response. I think maybe one of the things that I want to talk about or like go into with that is you mentioned that there are disparate outcomes for students based off of ability, based off of race, based off of uh, uh, based off of, I, I don't remember if you said socioeconomic factors. That's a big one. Well. I didn't mention that one, but that's a, that's a big one as well. Okay, okay. I, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, assume that. What what disparate outcomes are there? Yeah, so I mean, if you, so look at one common kind of way that students get sorted into writing placement program or writing programs is uh, through things like SAT or ACT scores, right? Um, and higher... As ACT and SAT scores are linked to uh, race, are linked to socioeconomic status. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, white students will uh, score higher on SAT and ACT tests. Um, 
uh, socially economic privileged students, students in higher SES brackets will score, do better, score higher on ACT and SAT tests. So if you're using the results of an ACT or an SAT test to place students into a program, then you are effectively uh, making sure that you will place more white students, uh, more SES privileged students into, uh, you know, certain writing spaces um, as opposed to others. So you have um, if that's if that's your only metric, if you're like, okay, students who score a 29 or higher on their ACT place into this class, what you're effectively doing is uh, gatekeeping by race or SES, um, you know, certain uh, courses. Uh, sounds pretty problematic. Yeah, to, to put it mildly, yes. If it's that big of a problem, are, are universities doing that? Is that like a common placement procedure? To, yes, to put it short answer, um, it is um, a problem that, in my opinion, isn't um, hasn't been addressed well enough at a lot of institutions. Some institutions, like the University of Michigan, use other placement measures, which I'm sure we'll we'll get into here, like a directed self placement. They use placement measures that try to give students more agency in this process to push back against the ways in which uh, some of the other ways they might have experienced writing assessment and writing placement um, have maybe conditioned them to think about writing as only one thing or another. So there are efforts being made by institutions and institutions are further studying how, you know, how alternate placement mechanisms might be more agentive to students. But um, I'd, I'd say it's still kind of a widespread problem that uh, people don't take writing assessment or the consequences of writing assessment and writing placement to be, you know, seriously enough. Yeah. Now, I think that you've argued the case well. I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. So one of the things that you brought up is directed self-placement and how that might be different from like the ACT mandated or institutionally mandated schema that might be present at other colleges. Do you want to, could you go a little bit more into how directed self-placement differs from standard placement processes? Yeah, so standard placement processes like the ACT or SAT example or AccuPlacer is another very common one where you upload basically an essay and it scores it automatically and gives you a score and then the institution is like, okay, if you score X or higher, you're in this course, X or lower, you're in that course. So those processes all have sort of an outside either kind of, you know, algorithm or person looking at your writing and saying, okay, I determined you did this well, so now you need to take this class. Directed self-placement, which your students might remember taking if it's, you know, been a little while, maybe they've uh, forgotten about it a little bit, uh, essentially has you do a writing task. It has you usually answer some type of uh, uh, survey kind of, you know, questions that ask you to reflect on your writing experiences. And then it's all, that's also usually paired with an essay task where it has you sit down and actually write an essay based on a prompt to give you an idea of what academic writing is like. And then after you go through all of that, the student then gets to decide which writing course is best for them. And that's kind of the unique thing with directed self-placement is that you go through these processes, these tasks that ask you to reflect on writing, all this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, the final choice is up to the student. Do I want to take uh, here at University of Michigan, English 125? Do I want to take writing 100, writing 120? What course best fits uh, my needs? in my future kind of writing goals and timeline as well. I think that was a great breakdown of maybe what the difference in those processes are. What are the positive consequences of those differences? Yeah, so DSP is imagined um, in allowing students to have that final choice to help resist some of the racialized outcomes that other placement mechanisms have, where uh, students of color in particular are sorted into sometimes what are referred to as remedial courses and things like that. So DSP is imagined to resist some of that. It's also imagined just to produce kind of, uh, you know, better or greater sort of student satisfaction with their writing courses, because at the end of the day, students are opting into a space as opposed to being told, you need to take this course. So students who end up um, in a certain course, particularly if it's a course like writing 100, they'll, they might feel like, you know, that they have more power in that decision. They might feel more satisfied in being in that space because they, at the end of the day, decided that that was the space that was best for them. And it's also imagined uh, in some ways to push back against the idea of, you know, there only being one kind of correct way of academic writing or one kind of uh, best way of academic writing, standardized American English or something like that. Because once again, it, it all comes down to that student choice. They get to opt into this. So that has consequences, hopefully beneficial consequences 
for students for local writing ecologies and institutions. You talked about the positive consequences of DSP. What, if any, are some of the negative consequences? So, <laughs> one challenge in talking about some of the negative consequences of DSP is that it's, DSP, once again, in my opinion, hasn't been studied enough. We have all of these imagined positive outcomes, and I shouldn't use the word imagined because DSP has been studied um, in some institutions to a degree that I think is satisfactory, um, to put it mildly there. One of the challenges with DSP is that it's what we call locally designed. That means every single institution that decides I want to use directed self-placement has to figure out what that looks like to them. As opposed to, once again, we go back to that ACT, SAT example. That's the same standardized test, right? That's the same test that's used all over the place. And although that comes with a lot of negative baggage, um, racist baggage, all these other sorts of things, that is kind of one point in ACT and SAT's favor is that it's the same exact test no matter where you take it, you know, depending on the year. Um, directed self-placement, though, at University of Michigan looks very different than it might look at another institution. So you change a few things in this test, and if you're not studying that at that local institution, okay, how is this affecting the local student population, then you could very well not be getting those benefits that you're hoping to get. You could very well be causing problems. So it's it's a, I guess one of the, the negatives for directed self-placement for writing programs that are interested in it is that you have to, once you figure out what it looks like, you have to continually study it and examine it and look at the data to see if you're still producing racialized outcomes, if you're still producing uh, problematic gender outcomes, all of, the, all of these other sorts of things. Um, because there are numerous articles and essays that push back at um, some of the uh, imagined positive benefits of directed self-placement, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a process that really forwards uh, student agency. And so some of the critiques that have been leveled against directed self-placement have to do with, um, you know, is this helping students figure out which writing class is best for them, or is it just measuring uh, who the most confident students are, right? Is it just measuring uh, the students who, you know, are, are most confident, or, you know, you might substitute the word confident for arrogant or something like that. Um, and you can imagine that once again, all of these things, gender, racial outcomes, all these other things, you know, the students who feel like they most belong in a space. Um, and if we look at historically, the students have most, you know, quote unquote, belonged in academic spaces in high, spaces of, you know, higher education are, you know, white male students, right? So is this just a kind of longer, more complicated way of measuring the students who are most likely to have confidence and feel like they belong in that space. Um, so there, there's been a whole bunch of critiques leveled, but at the end of the day, it, it, it all comes down to local institutions need to be doing local research to figure out if this is a better, more just test and placement mechanism than alternatives. Yeah, that's interesting. So you mentioned that uh, one of the negatives is that you know, it has to be locally designed and locally validated, locally researched, all of that. Is there like a higher cost with that, a higher barrier to entry? So, uh, and th that's, that's a really great question because one of the reasons people, I think, are or institutions are interested in directed self-placement is because it is purported to be cheaper, you know, more uh, uh, easier, you know, financially to utilize than something like a portfolio assessment where students would submit five of their best essays or three of their best essays and each of those essays would be looked at by a group of instructors and then those instructors would place those students, you know, that involves a lot of people and a lot of time. Um, whereas directed self-placement is, you know, the student is essentially researching for themselves how well they fit the institution and then, you know, deciding for themselves. I think there's a lot of confusing messages uh, around directed self-placement and, you know, how much it costs. And there's not a lot of transparent, you know, institutions aren't very forthcoming about, you know, how much is this costing us here, you know, for other institutions to compare to. I would say that likely institutions or people probably don't, I, I would say it's likely that institutions are interested in DSP without necessarily thinking about the amount of resources it takes to continually research, you know, the amount of you know, the, the salaries that need to be paid, the uh, dollars that need to go to graduate students or whomever is looking at these things. And instead, maybe they're just interested in the, oh, we don't have to pay a whole bunch of groups of writing instructors over the summer to look at student portfolios. or We don't have to pay this fee for using AccuPlacer or something like that. So there is a, there is a large financial cost that I think maybe isn't talked about enough when it comes to placement me mechanisms like this that, that that's, you know, kind of on the research end of things. 
Do you think that there's any hope for transparency on that front? I know that, you know, the financials of a department, I can imagine that those are locked down pretty hard in some ways. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I I can't imagine that, you know, that, that there is, you know, that'd be nice if there was some, uh, you know, at least, you know, even statewide database for how much is this, you know, placement mechanism costing institutions, departments. Um, but I can't imagine anything like that coming to fruition, at least anytime soon. It would certainly be helpful. Yeah, I guess I could walk back my statement like a little bit. A lot of these institutions, such as University of Michigan, you know, are public institutions, and they do have some sort of financial responsibility to the constituents of the state where it's, you know, there there is some transparency with what they do with their money, and maybe that could be used in some way. It, yeah, yeah, you have, you know, publicly available, you can look up, you know, the salaries and things like that. Um, but I think a lot of that data, one is challenging to sift through, and two is... <laughs> You know, there, there's, as Jason, as you well know, there's so many kind of levels of employees and things like that. And kind of, I think just looking at kind of the broader picture of, okay, this is how much a department, you know, funding, or this is how much, you know, one uh, faculty member or one individual is making, it doesn't quite give you the full picture as breaking it down even further would, but yeah. Yeah. So far, we've been talking a lot about directed self-placement in a writing context. Is that the only place that it's used in a university? Uh, no, it's used in, um, as, as far as I know, in math departments as well. Um, I don't believe it's as common, but it is something that there is uh, literature about. Is, um, is it being used in math departments to kind of help pl uh, place students into uh, the appropriate math course, you know, first year math course um, or later math courses? Um, that is, you know, slightly outside my area of expertise, but I, I, I would say that it is not, you know, test of self-efficacy of, you know, tests that determine you know, how confident students feel in the space, how able students feel in the space are not unique to writing programs, I would say. In math, even though the stakes are essentially the same, you know, it's a first year course that you need to get out of your way as generals in order to get into your program. But it feels like there's probably a greater range of grades that come from first year math than from first year writing. You know, I think first year writing tends to I mean, be seen as like maybe an easier class or it's graded more easily. And maybe that in some way impacts like the assessment of the placement processes. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a great point you're making there. I think your kind of assumptions there about, you know, kind of grade distributions, or I shouldn't say assumptions, but your, your, uh, you know, when you talk about kind of grade distribution, distributions that happen in first year writing class versus maybe other first year type classes, I think you're right on the money there with there being perhaps kind of more generous grade distributions happening in first year writing spaces. And that's perhaps why some institutions are more kind of accommodating to these types of directed self-placement tests that just allow students to decide at the end of the day because they see maybe that decision, you know, if a student decides to actually I'd rather take, you know, this 125 class as opposed to 100, maybe they see that as being not as potentially problematic at the end of the day, you know, because a student is still more likely to kind of, you know, get out of that 125 space with the grade that they want or with a passing grade at the very least. Um, so I could, I, I think if that's kind of the point you're making, I could see why maybe some of these tests like directed self-placement have, um, been taken up or kind of been experimented with to a greater degree in writing programs, as opposed to, uh, math programs that have, you know, historically seen larger numbers of students not pass or receive perhaps lower grades than they would like. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, you know, there's so many parallels to that as well, where I know in the writing department, you know, since COVID, not only at University of Michigan, but at other institutions where, you know, I have friends that I have talked to, the idea of labor-based grading contracts, where the grade is somewhere at the intersection of student content, student teacher, student, student interaction. And at the end of the day, even the grade can be the student's choice in a lot of these classes. And that's something that's like, theoretically, pedagogically, academically verified. But I don't know. I don't know if I've ever heard of that in a math department. Yeah, I can't say I have, but um, that, that's more probably due to me not looking into math departments and seeing what grading practices are going on there, more so than those things not happening. I'm sure there are people, 
experimenting with probably many of the same things. Um, you know, labor-based grading contracts have a long, even though they're, they're recently popularized, and for people who may not know what that is, those, these are kind of um, when you get into a class and, um, you know, the uh, instructor, the teacher, the professor, kind of whatever your, your, your level of education you're talking about <laughs> will uh, essentially provide you with, okay, here are essentially a checklist of things you need to do to get an A or to get a B or to get a C in this class. And those, that type of grading practice has a long history, I mean, decades long history and has been used in elementary education, secondary education, long before, as far as I know, it's been used in post-secondary spaces like here. Um, so I think we like to, in uh, college spaces, you know, as college instructors, professors like to pretend like these things we're coming up with sometimes are, are new and unique and things we've just, you know, kind of found out, but they, you know, they've been used in, uh, used by teachers far more experienced than us in elementary and secondary ed spaces long before us as well. No doubt. No doubt. I think that that's a, a valuable contribution. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a math department somewhere that's yeah. doing that, just like there are math departments doing directed self-placement. I would imagine though that the research, and you know, you can feel free to walk me back from this question, uh, but I would imagine that the research done on directed self-placement in a math department is very different than the research done on directed self-placement in another part of academia, like a writing department. Yeah, once again, once again speaking, you know, a little bit outside my area of expertise here, uh, but yes, I would imagine, I mean, even just looking as simply as, some of the, 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 some of the, the reasoning behind some departments using self-placement over others, you know, as we talked about writing departments are interested often in directed self-placement due to this sort of legacy of racism and other sorts of problematic things. I'm not saying those things aren't a part of math departments because they're a part of, you know, education more broadly, you know, education carries this baggage of racism with it here at the University of Michigan and, you know, more widely as well. Um, so yes, I'm sure there are, there are meaningful differences behind why some of these places, departments are interested in adopting these things. We talked about the financials as well. So yeah, we can't necessarily just lump all of these departments together and talk about here's why people are flocking to self-placement because I'm sure those reasons are, are multifaceted and uh, disciplinary specific as well. Yeah, and one of the things that you mentioned earlier is that directed self-placement can have uh, lots of different components that, mm -hmm. are those components interchangeable or is there one process so there isn't one process um, at the University of Michigan here, students go through, as I said before, sort of a questionnaire um, that asks them at about 10 questions to think about and reflect on their writing experiences. You know, how often have they written essays of this length or how comfortable are they with writing or, you know, questions kind of of that nature that ask them to just pause for a minute and kind of think about things they've done in their high school experiences or, you know, kind of their comfort level. Um, then it asks them to engage in a writing task as well. This is these are kind of completed side by side, um, where they kind of res respond in a few pages to a writing prompt. This year's was on sort of technology and tracking. So they re students read uh, for this year's directed self-placement, two articles on kind of uh, data surveillance in higher education spaces, and then, you know, responded in, you know, a few pages to that. Um, and, and then uh, as sort of a final step in kind of their placement process, they go to an advising session. And this in this advising session, there's lots of other things happening. They're figuring out their schedules for, you know, their whole semester, you know, thinking about, okay, where do I want to start college? But one of the things that happens in there is they place into that writing classroom. That's where that final decision makes and there's, that's where that final decision is made. And they're sitting there with an advisor who's able to ask uh, them questions or answer questions if they have any about, you know, which writing course might be preferable to them. Um, so this is just kind of the University of Michigan way of directed self-placement. Other writing programs don't have that advising component or don't have that essay component. I'd say the most common component that all of them have, though, is that questionnaire stage. At the very least, that seems to be one sort of common piece that you see throughout these, the, throughout these programs that use this. That's an excellent breakdown. Thank you so much. And those articles for the DSP this year at University of Michigan, just they sound so relevant and amazing. I wish I could thank the committee that chose those because they oh, sound yeah. amazing. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the different components of DSP. To what degree have each of those been validated? And where do you think the future of research is as far as validating those components? 
So uh, writing and validity is um, a whole box of, <laughs> a whole can of worms to, to, to open up here, but it's a great question. So when we talk about validity, I mean, at, at its most, most basic level, um, and this was, you know, I'm sure there'd be, if, any, if writing assessment scholars, if any of them listen to this, they'd, you know, probably yell at me because I, I would be way oversimplifying what validity is. But it's a very, at a very basic level, it's, you know, are you measuring what you're saying, what you're purporting to measure, right? So if I wanted to measure a student's ability to potentially succeed in a first year writing class, one of the things that I might want to do, and this is what directed self-placement does, is have them actually do a writing task, right? Instead of something like, um, you know, just asking them, you know, are you comfortable writing for a four page paper? You know, the directed self-placement here at Michigan actually asked them to write a paper. Right. And so that's kind of a, a way to get to get a little more of sort of a valid kind of approach to assessment because you're actually asking them to engage in this task. You know, you're not taking further steps back and asking them just to sort of reflect on this. Um, but, you know, even looking at the, the questionnaire, um, for example, you know, those those questions um, here at the University of Michigan in particular, there's uh, several kind of uh, studies that have been published in various journals like assessing writing and uh, college composition that have looked at the validity of those questions and seeing, you know, to what degree are the questions that are on that questionnaire, to what degree are they actually helping students to place themselves into courses, to what degree are those questions useful to students and being able to help them sort into spaces or succeed in spaces or not. Um, so it's, that, that's, validity is, you know, kind of one of those things, validity, fairness in particular, kind of what uh, are two of those kind of uh, things we want to think about when we examine how well an assessment is working or not. Um, and speaking towards, <laughs> excuse me, the future of kind of where directed self-placement research is going or needs to go, validity is sort of a, a constant question every time you make a tweak to a, an assessment, you want to, you know, check it, you know, check its validity, make sure you're doing so for valid reasons. But fairness is kind of, I see uh, a lot of questions, research questions around directed self-placement based around, you know, is this test actually more equitable? And specifically asking that question uh, of certain student populations. Is this test actually more equitable, producing more equitable outcomes for uh, English as another language students? Is this test actually more equitable or producing more equitable outcomes for students of color, right? So that's where I see the future of a lot of DSP research happening is these questions about validity, these questions about fairness broadly, yes, but then also these questions about validity and fairness being asked of specific student populations as well. Yeah, and I know that the multilingual student experience in post-secondary education is a, a research specialty of yours. How does that factor into directed self-placement? Do multilingual students go through the same process as native English speaking students? Or how, does, how do those two interact? Yeah, so multilingual English as another language uh, students um, go through a slightly different po uh, process. They go through basically one, one of the one of the most different aspects of the DSP for them is the questionnaire, where if on that questionnaire you answer that English is you know not the language you're most proficient in, um, you're sort of sorted into a whole different version of the questionnaire that substitutes several different. Uh, several questions for slightly modified versions and adds another question on the end that asks about your proficiency with uh, standard American English or standard English. So it's, it's a slightly different process that focuses very heavily on how comfortable they are speaking, writing, using uh, what we call standard English or, you know, what uh, people listening might be more familiar with as academic English or something like that. And so it's, it's, it's fairly similar. Once again, they still get to make that decision at the end, but there are some questions in there that really focus on ability to use English, um, comfort level with English. So it is, it is, I think, small differences, but very meaningful differences. Right. I can imagine that type of sorting of native English speaking students from multilingual students, if not done correctly, could actually produce significant, substantial, and more negative outcomes for multilingual students. How do you think that a university writing program can avoid that? Or how does University of Michigan, if you want to speak to the writing program here, uh, use that as a tool for social justice rather than injustice? 
Yeah, it's a, that's a, once again a great question. Um, like you said before, kind of my research interests are in this area. So it's challenging because there isn't one way. Use that word, you know, what's the correct way to do this? And unfortunately, there isn't a, you know, necessarily a correct way. There's a lot of problematic ways we've done this kind of sorting in the past. And we can't really talk about multilingual students or English uh, as another language students as being, you know, a monolith either, because as the research has shown, you know, investigating these programs, you know, some of these students feel most comfortable and feel uh, most successful in courses like um, writing 120, for example, which is uh, writing for multilingual writers or English for multilingual writers. And so, and some of the research has shown that uh, some multilingual students prefer to be in classes with their, you know, kind of monolingual peers, right? Their English speaking monolingual peers. So there isn't one correct way we can really say this is this is the way that placement should happen. This is the way that placement should happen for uh, multilingual students. Um, rather, what we can do and what's being done here at the University of Michigan and other spaces is are these sort of continuous examinations. I think what you always want to make sure you're, you're, you're doing in these kind of assessments, one, looking at, yes, kind of, you know, the data point outcomes, you know, what students are succeeding, um, you know, in these courses, what are, you know, kind of uh, GPAs, grade point averages, how are they doing kind of their upper level writing courses? Yes, I think that is very important. Um, but you also want to, I think, in doing, doing this research, get the student voice in there as well, right? So surveying students, interviewing students, asking about their experiences in each of these writing classrooms, um, and sort of constantly making uh, tweaks to the way the writing program works, meaningful uh, changes here and there, in a way that is informed by those student voices and kind of the the outcomes those that that we've been able to observe later on you know kind of years down the road doing sort of longitudinal study work where you look at how students do in a writing classroom their first year but then also how they're doing in their writing classrooms three years later you know after the uh, you know after they graduate in the job market all these other sorts of things as well so it's a constant constant process where you're always trying to find ways to figure out what it means for a writing program to be successful and what you even mean by success. Awesome. That is such a great answer. That highlights, I think, you know, some of the principles of directed self-placement that have been through lines for this whole conversation. You know, students are autonomous. They're individuals. Lumping them together and saying, you go here, you go there, uh, can not always be the best way to, to sort them. You know, maybe it's better to respect the individuals, inform them, and allow them to choose. I like that. I think that sounds like a, a great model. Okay, last question. Why should somebody who is already graduated or not yet in college or perhaps possibly not even attending college care in any way about these issues of placement? Because when we're talking about writing placement, when we're talking about language, language, when you, talk, you can't just talk about language and talk about just language. When you talk about language, you inevitably talk about race, you talk about gender, you talk about sexuality, you talk about disability, you talk about all of these other factors. Language is never just as simple as, as language, right? We all use language in a way that correlates with our identity, correlates with our positionality, our, our kind of, uh, our multitude of identities. We all use language in sort of different ways. So when we talk about the mechanisms we use to sort students by language, to rank students by language, we are inevitably going to be talking about ranking and sorting them by race, by gender, by other sorts of very, but in other ways that become very, very, very explicitly problematic. So for someone saying, why should I care about how people talk about language, about how people assess language, if you are interested in any of these other aspects, if you view yourself as a person who is an anti-racist, if you view yourself as a person who cares about justice, about social justice, then you should very much, I would say, care about how we talk about language as well. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and thank you for lending your expertise to us for this morning. Well, thanks for having me. I hope I didn't bore anybody too badly. Um, it was a pleasure talking, Jason. All right. Well, Andrew, have a good day. Bye. Bye, everybody.